Hi, uh, I'm Paul and this is... I'm Charlie. And we're here from the Open Source Satellite Programme where we are trying to design, uh, the de make a design of the next generation micro satellite platform. Uh, so it's a spacecraft platform where we'll be open sourcing the everything to do with it. So the uh, from requirements right the way through to the electronics, computer aided design, the mechanical design, the software, the VHDL, all the bits that you, that are make up um, a a spacecraft. So we're going to be open sourcing this design. It's been an exciting program I've been involved with for quite a bit of time, and through that journey we've we've been uh, we've been learning a lot about different aspects of spacecraft design uh, we've got some experience of doing it ourselves but uh, through different companies and that kind of thing so we come together and we're trying to do this thing that could help to transform the space industry learn the lessons from new space where um, you know we've got the innovation of cubesats um, and we're trying to sort of build upon that and uh, make a spacecraft platform that's slightly larger more capable than a cubesat um and uh make it open source which is very exciting very cool and actually our aspect our, our, our kind of um function within this uh, organization is with uh, embedded software so both me and charlie are both embedded software engineers and both got a bit of experience of electronics as well and um and we're here today to try and demystify some of the things uh to do with something called csp uh, which we'll get into, but when we're not me. here, there's things that we enjoy doing. Um, we have been known to sort of take to the stage and, uh, you know, uh, rock it out. Uh, what's your favourite band, Charlie? Nirvana, of course. Nirvana, of course, ob obviously. <laughs> He's like kind of a bit of a Kurt Cobain lookalike, but, uh, you know, um, we, we, you know, we, we have a go with music and that kind of thing. And, um, Certainly, um, when uh, I was, uh, well, in the summer, we, we managed to get onto the stage at a little sort of music festival thing. And I said to Charlie, right, what, what should we play? And he said, um, Nirvana, of course. Nirvana, <laughs> of course. And, uh, and so I was forced to sing like Kurt Cobain. And when you're 45, that's not necessarily so easy. Uh, but we had a great time. Love doing that kind of thing. So that's the kind of thing we do. What other things do we like? We like the pub. Yeah. We like the pub. Um, yeah. Fair sports. Yeah. But, you know, we've got the, one of those jobs where actually what we like doing is what we have to do on the day to day as well, which is pretty cool, actually. And I'm sure there are a lot of people who are probably watching this video have jo jobs that are similar to that. So high five to you. High five to us. High five. We got we got cool jobs, <laughs> geeky jobs. But if you're a geek, a geek job's a cool job. So you know, there we go. Anyway, why am I wittering on? I don't know. Let me talk about CSP. So what is it, and why why am I sat here talking about it? So, as part of the design of the spacecraft, you have to uh, design the communication aspects. Um, so, you know, how is one subsystem within a within a spacecraft? Let's say a power system. How does it talk to another subsystem on the spacecraft? You know, maybe the onboard computer or something like that. How do these things talk together? Um, and uh, what protocol do they use in the communication? Uh, not only that, you know, the spacecraft has also got to communicate with the ground over a radio and from the ground to the spacecraft. So how does that work? Well, in the new space industry, uh, there, there's been this invention called CSP which stands for CubeSat Space Protocol, CSMP. And this thing, um, it, it describes exactly that. It describes how you would communicate from the ground to the spacecraft uh, and from the spacecraft to the ground, and also how subsystems on the spacecraft communicate with one another, which all sounds fan dabby dozy And there are uh, other protocols out there. and. You know, the space industry is much like a uh, looking out the window in, in the UK and looking at the weather. It's varied. It's very varied. And, you know, I look out, we're actually in front of a window right now. And I'm looking out and it is very, very gloomy out there. Um, a sort of shade of grey, I would say. Wouldn't you? I would say the same, yeah. And, um, you know, I'm, I might get here tomorrow and look out the window and I might see more grey. Um, 
quite likely. Or I might actually see, you know, sunshine and uh, a cloudless sky. Very good analogy. Never again. <laughs> and the space and the, the space industry is much like that. New space and the and the sort of you know uh, the more um, institutional space industry, the the ESA, the NASA, they are they are actually quite different in the way that they they deal with things. And particularly when it comes to things like communications protocols, if you sort of want to find out about some of the the, the way the institutional space industries and, and uh, use these de or, or define these things then you'll discover something called CCSDS. And we've done another video on CCSDS. And um, it's uh, it's very, very well documented, really well documented. It's it's kind of like, you know, you go on to ccsds.org, I think it is, or .com, something, just to Google it. And, um, and you'll be slapped across the face by blue books. Uh, and these blue books have got a lot of information in them, which is fantastic. Because it's uh, you know it gives you a really really sound understanding, but if you're just trying to get into it and try to understand it, it can be quite tricky because it's just a huge slapping of information in your face. Now, if on the other that. hand, CSP has come out of the new space industry, and uh, with this one, it's kind of like it's quite different again. It's like there is there's no real thing that you can read on the internet or, or like or, or something like that that really tells you how it works now there's some great resources out there if you, if you go that. on the internet you'll find on github libcsp which is a open source implementation of the csp protocols implemented in c code that you can put onto your microcontroller or your bit of electronics or your windows machine or whatever and uh, compile and uh, get it get it working and that's fantastic, particularly if you don't care too much about how it works. But when you get to a problem, you try to debug it, or you're trying to understand it and the implications of its use, then you really need to understand how it works. And and this is a bit tricky with uh, CSP, because if you want to find out how it works, you just got to download the code, right? And, and read through reams of C code, which for Charlie is easy, yeah? This guy, it absor it's like, if he's in a room full of C code, the C code just kind of gets, it just goes into his skin, into his pores, and, and he can absorb it, right? Uh, but for the likes of you and me and the rest of the humanity, um, not that there's anything wrong with you, Charlie, uh, but, um, you know, uh, it, it's, it's not so easy to, to take any information out of the code like that. So, um, so we thought we'd do this video, which is a bit of an explainer. Now, the bit of CSP that we're describing today is really all to do with um, how CSP packets, which might come up from the ground to the spacecraft, might yeah. get um, kind of decomposed or fragmented into smaller frames of information. Uh, because CSP actually, uh, it's called CubeSat Space Protocol, actually has its kind of, um, its heritage, I guess, with CAN bus specifically, which is quite a common CAN, uh, you know, a, a bus system for onboard systems on spacecraft. And CAN bus uh, is great for a lot of things. We're real big fans of CAN bus, and they've got another video about CAN bus. It's there. Uh, the person who's doing the podcast will have to edit that link up there. So sorry about that, Emily. <clears throat> but um, but uh, yeah. So if you've got your CSP packet, which comes up from the ground to the spacecraft. And it's this long. Now it needs to get fragmented up into can frames. And how does that work? And, and you know, we 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 now implemented this a few times, haven't we, for different projects, different subsystems, and stuff like that. And this is the video that we wish we had seen because it would have really helped in our understanding of this stuff. So, without further ado, Charlie is going to explain CSP. So it's a great overview. So CSP, specifically CFP, that is CAN Fragmentation Protocol, <laughs> it chops up the CSP packet and sticks it all onto CAN frames, specifically CAN 2.0 extended frames, which is very well defined, has a good ISO standard, and is very robust, known to be robust. Your car probably runs it. Um, so CAN frames are divided into like three main chunks. So there's a identifier A, identifier B, 
and the data you're sending. The, the two identifier parts kind of coincide, uh, totaling 29 bits. Um, the CFP that... uses this to put all the, the specific frame metadata into it. And then the data section is whatever you want it to be, with the exception that the first CFP frame has a six byte header, but I'll get onto that. So with all of these graphics and this intimidating amount of text, uh, we can just easily break it down. So the source node and destination nodes, you can easily compare it to an IP address. So uh, only difference is this is just a five bit number. So you can say like 10, 12, whatever number you want. Then the source port and destination port, the exact same as an IP port yet again, but this one is six bits. And then the frame type, this is used specifically within CFP. Uh, it's just a one bit flag to say, is it the first frame or not? Zero means it's first frame. One means it's any number of frames after that. That's really good for the receiving end. So it can infer kind of the order of the frame should be. And also, uh, if this is a number zero, you know that the first six bytes is the CSP header. Again, I'll get onto that. Frames remaining is literally just an integer of how many frames you are going to send following up. Yeah. Packet ID is the same throughout every CFP frame, uh, which make up a big CSP packet so that the receiving end can associate them all and be like, all of these ones have the same packet ID, so they're what part of one big packet. Priority, yeah. uh, this isn't actually used, from what yeah. I can tell, in the version one for CSP. Maybe it can be used in software if you want to prioritize some telecoms, something like that. Um, but with version two, it actually makes use of canvas arbitration. So the lower the priority number, the more immediate it has to get to the receiving end. But that works on the frame basis, not the full packet basis. Flags get a little bit more confusing um, because it gives kind of abilities to add and remove stuff and specify different ways to do stuff. Most of it isn't relevant to CFP, but I'll go through them anyway. So CRC32, this is just a checksum, make sure all your data is intact. Uh, one thing which might be very important if you're implementing your, if you're implementing this yourself is it's the CRC32C polynomial. Yes, that's just gold dust. Took a while to figure it out. You can yeah. also add a SHA-1 HMAC to some basic kind of authentication stuff. Then you can also include SFP fragmentation, which is usually done on top of RDP. Um, since we're all using CFP fragmentation, it's not really relevant. Um, but there is a resource that actually explains kind of the use of this online if you just Google it. Packet length, that's the total number of data bytes that you're sending in the entire CSP packet. And data is the data you actually want to send. Yeah. So if you take an example CSP packet. The first frame, slightly unique because all of the header information, metadata with the priority, source node, destination node, all those things, those get inserted into the first six bytes. You can see how it's laid out. And at the very end, you then have two bytes to start putting your actual data in, the stuff that you want to transmit. Um, this does cause a bit of a downside for CSP where if you're talking to stuff on the canvas, you can only send two bytes in a single frame. And if you want to send something more, such as the timestamp, which is usually like 64 bits for Epoch, you'll need to send at least two frames. If you compare that to CanTS, you can send that all in one frame and you can use canvas arbitration. So everything will receive the timestamp quite quickly. Mm. Yeah, deterministically, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the next frames after that, they don't need that header because it already has it, but all of the identifier bits are slightly changed. So the frame type is now one specifying it's not the first frame. And then all of your remaining data up to eight bytes gets put into the data section. You can put your next how many bytes up to eight bytes into there. Um, but this is, we're still trying to send 20 bytes. So we need a third frame where the remaining four bytes can go in. This long 20 byte CSP message has been fragmented up using CFP into three frames. So once you have these frames, you can send them all to the destination node. 
But one thing to note is there's no acknowledgement. So you either need to assume it got there or assume it didn't. Whichever one. Whatever you fancy. Yeah. Like, yeah. Make the assumption. Yeah. <laughs> um, we've seen some of our suppliers, vendors, whoever, they have a protocol on top of this to specify when you receive a CSP packet over CFP, you want to send an acknowledgement so you actually know it got there. And I haven't actually seen an example of them not doing that. So it's a pretty good thing to have. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, CSP doesn't support it in this immediately. We'd you need something else on top, don't you? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty much how you break down a large CSP packet into all these different trunks, send it over CAN bus. Uh, it ends up working quite well. There may be some alternative things you want to do which CSP can't quite cope with. Mm. Yeah, so thank you, Charlie. Uh, like, yeah, I'm imagining that if you're watching this video, hopefully, you know, I, this might appeal to people who are currently sat in a lab and they've got a canvas analyzer in front of them and they're, they're trying to decode, like, what on earth is going on on this canvas? It's running this CSP thing, but I don't really know how it works. Charlie here hopefully has given you the tools that you can use to understand how these CAN frames are being um, kind of segmented apart, the fragmentation and the reconstruction of the data and that kind of thing. So, um, yeah. Uh, so, in conclusion, CSP is widely used in the new space community. Uh, it is a reference implementation that is open source available on, um, on GitHub. Just Google libcsp. Uh, it, it's great in many ways, uh, but it doesn't leverage many of the features of Canvas. And, you know, Charlie was talking there about how you might want to, for example, send a time around a system and synchronize to a time. The beauty of Canvas is that you can, um, by using uh, identifiers in your, in, you know, in your, in your frames, you can prioritize the traffic and that's done at a very low level. So, you know, if, if I send a CAN frame with an ID of one, I know it's going to get there before any CAN frame that is of ID seven, for example, if they're, if both, if, if you're trying to transmit both at the same time, it's all dealt with at a very, very low level. So that's what makes it a great thing. It also means that you could, for example, um, transmit time, broadcast the time or multicast the time to multiple nodes all in one go. Uh, and um, that you'd have a, lone, a, a known latency um, for, for that transmission. And that works lovely if you've got eight data bytes to play with. But with CSP, unfortunately, you don't. Um, you, you, pretty much everything you do is going to be at least kind of two CAN frames normally because the, the amount of data that you've got for transmission in a single CAN frame is limited to 16 bits or two bytes. So um, we actually advocate uh, an alternative, which is called CAN-TS. It's got uh, lots of advantages, in our opinion, over CSP. Uh, it's more data per uh, single frame. It's good for time synchronization. It's good for the distribution of attitude data. Um, it's a simple protocol uh, with less uh, fragmentation. And it can, because it's quite simple, it would be simple to implement on uh, simple electronics, like maybe an 8-bit PIC microcontroller, very, very low power. Um, CSP, on the other hand, if you want to use uh, libcsp, really um, you're you're bundling that with a, an operating system like FreeRTOS or something like that. And and that is kind of, you know, drawing you down into the ARM microcontroller 32-bit uh, land, you know. And whilst those things are very low power it, as for 32-bit processors, they're not kind of on the same scale of power saving as as maybe uh, pick microcontrollers and that kind of thing. So, um, so yeah, hopefully this little explainer video has helped you in your in your work and uh, you know like and subscribe or whatever. Um, my kids actually laugh at me because with YouTube I, I say yeah we got ten hits and they're like what's a hit? Hey, it's good. It's a view. So like subscribe view. I sound like an old man now. I'll stop talking. Thank you very much. Thank you.